Endings are hard. When Chrysalis Part 2 released, it was the culmination of six expansions and hundreds of quests. It promised big things, and with rides across the ocean on giant beasts and ancient eldritch beings, it's safe to say it delivered. So how did it end? With Morganth falling through some cracked glass. When Valencia Part 2 released, it was tasked with the unenviable goal of condensing nearly half a dozen expansions into one tidy half-world. The effects of that decision are clearly felt, with characters often bursting into long exposition dumps at a moment's notice. We wouldn't get to visit El Dorado, the main mystery at the heart of Pirate 101, but Valencia Part 2 is a far more respectable ending than it probably should have been. When Imperia Part 2 released, the stakes couldn't be higher. It was a battle between two ancient gods, the final conflict in a feud that had lasted for millennia, since existence itself. So how does it end? The two make up in a few minutes, no biggie. Suffice to say that King's Isle has had a somewhat difficult time really nailing a satisfying climax to their stories, even if the build-up to it is often excellent. It's not hard to see why. When stories are allowed to germinate for years, as is the case with all of these arc-based narratives, the demands can quickly become unreasonable. It was doubtful there ever could have been a conclusion to Imperia that would have completely satisfied, not perhaps without at least a few million extra dollars and another year of development. The key to these kinds of stories, then, is in expectation. Setting up the scope of the narrative just right, trying not to promise the world no one could ever deliver. Which brings us to Wallaroo. As the finale to the fourth arc, it holds a special and yet precarious position. It is the first finale world since Dragonspire to not be a second part in some fashion. It also has a lot of ground to cover. The conflict with the Zine, the governors of the Spiral Powers, the growing negative sentiment towards the wizard, the Cabal in the First World, and of course whatever new things Wallaroo itself has to offer. Wallaroo is also, at least in terms of quest length, an inaccurate measure of length if there ever was one, one of the shortest worlds King's Isle has ever produced, sitting at a mere 83 quests. It seems like one tough order, but does it succeed? Is Wallaroo able to stick the landing? Actually, yes. Mostly. Let's start off with the things I liked, since there's a lot. Speaking only of the world itself, Wallaroo is an unbridled triumph. Level design has been a sticking point for the fourth arc, with many criticizing the decision to reuse geometry and assets in Lemuria and Novus, despite their in-universe justifications. Reuse has always been a sliding scale, and some of it is better than others. Arc 4 has demonstrated both ends of that scale. On the better side, we have areas like Heap and Puerto Nuovo, which use familiar objects and places in a wholly new way, creating a decidedly unfamiliar feel. On the other hand, Night Forest and the Badlands feel a little too familiar. The world synthesizer stole pieces of the world. It didn't steal Dundara specifically. But this debate is moot. The zones in Wallaroo are fantastic, easily the most impressive collection of areas we've seen in the arc. The Outback makes the welcome return of a wide open zone, something that's been absent since the Arrow Plains in Imperia Part 2. I especially appreciated the cliff dungeons at the far end of the Outback, letting us take in the full view of the zone. If you're going to make an impressively big area, you might as well show it off. I'll admit that dark blues and purples especially are my favorite colors, so I may be a bit biased, but the later zones in Wallaroo are stunning. One field area in the Kali Ranch has us walking through thickets of tall grass, a windmill slowly rotating in the background against the starry night sky. Wizard 101 has rarely felt this atmospheric. Ditto for the Eucalyptus Forest, which may be one of the best looking zones they've ever produced. A bright purple lake capturing the focus of the zone, an eerie purple fog blanketing the surrounding grass. All of these areas are of course complemented by perfectly fitting music, but that's a given for the game. You'd be hard pressed to find anyone that disagreed on this point. From a gameplay perspective, Wallaroo also sticks the landing quite nicely. The world has a solid complement of bosses, all of whom cheat, a feat I don't believe any other world has done before. Of particular note are the Campfire solo bosses, which provides a nice challenge befitting of a now 15-year-old game. Every time I saw the quest icon show a campfire, I let out an audible, oh no. In the good sense, that is. 170 levels in, it's nice to break a sweat occasionally. What's really impressive though is the pacing of the world. You're in and out of each area in just a handful of objectives. Most areas can't be much more than 10 or so quests, and there isn't a lot of unnecessary filler. It's surprising how little some of these areas and mobs are even used. Enemies like the Bunyips, despite showing up in promotional material and spells, are a mob you fight for one quest, and no other side quests or sigil ever has you fight another. 
That's not really a complaint per se, but it is a surprise. We've clearly come a long way since the grind of the second arc, where every enemy was fodder for at least three or four defeat and collect quests. It's a significant upgrade, and that's been true for most of the fourth arc as a whole, although I probably could have done with a few less red caves during my stay. Suffice it to say, the experience of going through Wallaroo is extremely smooth, but that wasn't really ever the concern. Whether Wallaroo succeeds as the capper to the fourth arc is largely going to depend on its story, and on that front, the answer is a lot more complicated. Wallaroo continues many of the preoccupations Wizard101 has clearly shown interest in over the past few years. If the fourth arc has been about anything, it is exploitation. The fear that, left unguarded and unprotected, bad faith actors, selfish and hubristic people, will worm their way into important societal structures and actively seek to subvert them for their own gain. We see this resembled in a multitude of ways throughout the arc. The happiness initiative in Caramel was corrupted by Nana's megalomaniacal ambition, transforming the population of the world into an abused labor force. In Novus, Tung Ok takes control of design and quite literally contorts the land to fulfill his selfish wishes, creating a palace of lavish gold statues, symbols of his power. This fear of subversion continues into Wallaroo, represented through the Dreaming. Wallaroo's main narrative deals with a conflict between two factions, the Townies and the Drovers, with very different opinions on how best to deal with the Dreamwater, Wallaroo's greatest cultural artifact, a substance which has the power to make people's dreams into reality. The townies wish to share the water with the rest of the spiral, while the drovers wish to preserve the majority of it where it currently is, behind the Great Barrier, only allowing an extremely select few access to its mystical properties. The drovers' reasoning should sound quite familiar. They worry about the wrong minds entering the Dreaming. A twisted mind has the ability to corrupt the Dreaming, and this enormous risk generates the perfect excuse to cut the dream water off from the rest of the world. They live in fear that somehow, if the wrong minds enter the Dreaming, the entity that creates it will be corrupted. The Drovers worry if even one ugly thought enters the Dreaming, it will have a cascading effect. The water will be forever tainted, the magic lost forever. In some sense, Wizard101 itself personifies the Drovers' fears. Compared to previous arcs, areas in Arc 4 have been increasingly cosmopolitan and urbanized. Caramel City is a large funhouse attraction, where customers are asked to rate their experience after practically every right turn. Sky City is a caricature of mid-20th century design and lifestyle, the conflict in that area precipitated by a brainwashed neighborhood watch. Novus itself is supposed to be a gathering hub of the Spiral's cultures, with the Polarians customizing La Via Rose with residential districts, cafes, and theaters. Hope Springs recalls the touristy caramel, with lines of visitors waiting to see a play at the local theater. The town is ultimately revealed to be a tourist trap, advertising dream water as their main export, a product they can't currently deliver. Creative as some of these locations may be, they're quite a bit different from what's come before. From spellbinder to valued customer, Wizard101 has become fascinated with depictions of magic being uprooted and commodified, hollowed out until only naked avarice remains. Billabong Resort is a lavish hotel, as Joan points out, corrupted by insatiable greed. We even get into a battle with some guests because we don't heat up their sandwiches. At one point, we're offered a discount on a night's stay for helping out. Not exactly the experience points and spell elements we're used to receiving. Indeed, a major side quest chain throughout the fourth arc sees various artists writing their own stories. In Wallaroo, they attempt to adapt the wizard story into a play, something they hope will turn a hefty profit. They even alter the framing of the story to reflect feedback from Tess's audiences. For a game about summoning fantastical creatures, there's something decidedly unflattering and unmagical about all of this. What was once supposedly escapist fantasy has been twisted into cynical realism, complete with imperialistic empires and biased court systems. On some level, it's easy to see the drover's point. Can't we just go back to the good old days, the purer time, where our primary concern was stopping evil sorceresses by pulling swords out of Artorian legend? The expansion is highly skeptical of this argument. Throughout the world, we're hounded by Freddy Croker, yet another Cabal agent who wants to restore the First World. We later learn that Freddy was able to access the Dreaming proper through the underground pipes pumping in dream water to Billabong Resort. Pipes which never should have been there in the first place. On one hand, this seems to prove the Drovers right. 
The greed of the townies is precisely what allowed the incident to happen in the first place. On the other hand, there's a marked irony to the situation. It makes sense that Freddy is the one ultimately able to slip into the dreaming. He and the drover's aims in some sense align. Much like how the drovers seal away the dreaming and intentionally drain the rest after they claim it was corrupted by unworthy minds, the Cabal's aim to restore the first world is predicated on the desire to restore a purer version of the spiral, to recreate the halcyon days where peace and tranquility reigned, where corruption and greed were alien concepts. In both cases, there's the argument that something beautiful has been perverted and mangled. Yet Wallaroo argues this pure world never really existed, nor an uncorrupted dreaming. When we enter the dreaming ourselves, each character is forced to reckon with their past actions via phantom images conjured up by the water. Each character comes to realize how mistaken their past selves were. Joan observes she was just as brutalistic and uncaring as her associate Mr. Kane, overworking her staff while knowingly overcharging her customers. Joan is surprised by this. Earlier in the expansion, she absolves herself of any guilt, rationalizing that she recognized her mistake in building the hotel, and left Billabong before the greed truly began. But her account of history and herself were fictitious, based on the person Joan believes herself to be, not by who she actually was. Our memories of the past are false, morphed into the inspiration and dreams of tomorrow, rather than the accurate depiction of long-lost yesterdays, as Sybil suggests. Dreams, then, are based on myth, a fantasy no one is really sure existed at all, as Design argued at the end of last expansion. And for some, a vision of a better yesterday makes no sense at all. Ned Colley recounts how when the spiral lost interest in Wallaroo, it became a dumping ground for criminals and unwanteds. Ned's ancestors worked and toiled, but never amassed anything out of it, because the judges and townies own Ned's land and discreetly threaten to make him homeless unless he fulfills his quotas. There are no halcyon days for Ned to return to, only an aimless life of dispossession and indifference. What does a purer form of life even look like for Ned Colley? In these ways, Wallaroo rejects the notions of the drovers, arguing the only way to help people like Ned is to look towards the future, not nostalgize the past. Judge Veg makes perhaps the most scathing indictment, claiming the dream of the first world is for the unimaginative maniacs, a focusing lens for the alienated and antisocial. There's something particularly interesting about this. Respectable that the game argues we have no need to see what the first world looked like, despite it being a cornerstone of the game's lore. It always seemed like a perfect idea for an expansion later down the line, to see the beginnings of the world we've spent over a decade questing in. But Wizard101 refuses. We don't need to see the first world, because it has nothing valuable to offer us anymore. Wallaroo grounds itself very clearly in themes and interests of the fourth arc. In the Novus section of my previous Wizard101 video, I argued that design was a metaphor for democracy, and how increasing political division and polarization serves to disrupt democracy's vital functions. Wallaroo essentially offers a redux of this same storyline. The conflict over the Dreamwater is design all over again. Much like how design molded the shards to suit its hosts' wants and desires, the dreaming brings to life the wills of the dreamer. And rather than use this wonderful tool to its fullest potential, it is wasted on fights over who owns and controls it, as the governors did with design. And like Novus, Wallaroo suggests something more sinister is happening behind the scenes, a sense in which the argument over drover and townie, past and future, conservation and progression is largely manufactured. In line with the arc's themes of exploitation, these conflicts are merely a pretext, stoked by illiberal actors who use the chaos to further their own agendas. The Manticore deliberately planted seeds of a conspiracy within Novus to make tensions so inhospitable people would no longer wish to stay, leaving Design all for himself. Freddy invokes a similar tactic, resurrecting extinct beings to help drive further chaos amongst the townies and drovers, leaving the Dreaming all to himself. But Wallaroo adds to the conversation Novus has started, returning Wizard 101 to its favorite fixation, the children. Wallaroo seems to be teeming with radicalized youth. Freddy explicitly targets the young of Wallaroo to be his agents of chaos, manipulating them into believing the entire world is out to get them. Townies, drovers, dingoes, it doesn't matter. They all plan to ruin Wallaroo. 
In this way, Freddy captures a sort of populist attitude. He and the emu writers make fun of the wizard for wasting time playing politics. And why shouldn't they believe this? Freddy has already poisoned the well. Working together will produce no positive results. These groups have no interests beyond themselves. Even Santiago admits during his time with the Cabal, he was young, driven by crusade and rhetoric, an attitude which caused him to let the Old One create the world synthesizer, even though he knew it was wrong at the time. There's the sense Wallaroo is concerned with the ways we engage with one another, deliberately misinterpreting each other's points, tuning out ideas we dislike, never being open to a change in opinion. When Morp is confronted with what the Drovers did to secure the Dreaming, she stops the conversation short, claiming the atmosphere has grown toxic before shutting herself away in a shed. It's like watching a Twitter, uh, sorry, X conversation in real life. But Wallaroo argues that when we refuse to have these conversations, we generate terminal conflict, a conflict which breeds resentment and hopelessness. And when that disillusionment is stoked, the ones who suffer are the young, swinging the door wide open for opportunists to reshape them into nothing more than pawns for those same opportunists' plans. Wallaroo is a clever world, one that continues the good character work and theming of those prior. It's a world about the myth of a better yesterday, and how that myth can be turned into a tool for great destruction. In that sense, it fits very well with the fourth arc's preoccupations. Beyond exploitation of the magic, or water, or peoples, Wallaroo focuses on the exploitation of the past. How easily it can be to unwittingly reinvent facts for our own comfort and ease. It's also clever how the arc has managed to weave its areas into that message. I commented before about the rise of cosmopolitan areas in the game, but that shouldn't be interpreted as a negative. Instead, an affirmation. However, I mentioned at the start of this video that I wasn't completely happy with the full picture of this expansion. So what exactly is it that I didn't like? Well, like I said, endings are hard. The problems begin no later than our return to Novus. On paper, the story's end makes a great deal of sense. The governors, so outraged by Design's rejection of them, decide that if they can't have Design, no one can. Thus, with their newly outfitted Doom Moon, they can destroy Canatus, and with it, the heart and soul of Novus. Moreover, after the wizard inevitably stops the governor's plot, the decision to reconcile the Cabal and the Arcanum makes sense too. The Ark started that way, and the Cabal genuinely was seeking for peace despite appearances. It's only fitting that a newly impassioned design should be the one to initiate the ceremony, rectifying his first mistake. Inspect the details any further, however, and I have a lot of qualms with how the whole situation plays out. Let's start out with that final ceremony. Sybil makes mention that this story began long before Design found himself yearning for the spiral, a statement I can only understand to mean that it is referring to the schism between the Cabal and the Arcanum. Indeed, it wouldn't be a stretch to say that one of the primary topics of this arc has been all about mending the schism. The problem with this storyline though is that, at least in the context of the fourth arc specifically, it has been a painfully one-sided schism. From the summit at Caramel, to the Old One's machinations in Lemuria, to the Manticore and Freddy, we get a lot of insight into the internal politics of the Cabal and their feelings about the matter. But the Arcanum has been relegated to the nosebleed seats for just about the entire arc. Often the scholars are there just to give the needed exposition before we mosey off to whatever world we need to go to. There's been little in the way of actual interrogation of the Arcanum and how they feel about the schism since Mirage. The end result is that the Ioni's statement that the Arcanum cannot merely be a hoard of precious knowledge feels unearned. The scholars have never had to learn this understanding. There's something very interesting in this comment too. Wallaroo seems to suggest that the Arcanum had a part to play in the continuation of the schism. Santiago notes the schism caused the Arcanum to lose its zeal for exploration. Wallaroo suggests the Arcanum was left just as shattered as the Cabal. There was an easy vector through which the expansion could have explored this angle. Xander, as his spell quest reveals, was once in training to become a thought leader, a drover who protects the dreaming. There's an interesting parallel to be made between the two groups, one who hoards the dreaming away behind a giant wall, and another which hoards knowledge away behind lines of dusty bookshelves. Just as the expansion explored how the Drover's unwillingness to part even a drop of Dreamwater was hurting Wallaroo, the same could have been done with the Arcanum, with Xander as the vector to explore that story. 
However, like with the rest of the scholars, Xander is relegated to his office for the entirety of the world, giving us the needed exposition before not appearing again until the summit. He apparently has no thoughts whatsoever about the giant political upheaval coming to his home world. But I've only begun to speak about the issues with the summit. The Cabal has remained a somewhat vexing element throughout the arc. It's ultimately a smart decision to round out that storyline now. We've had a new Cabal villain for practically every expansion since their introduction Mirage seven years ago. It was more than time for that to stop. However, not all of those villains were born equally. Freddy stands as one of the less compelling villains. This is for a simple reason. He's never given proper motivation. Why does he want to restore the First World? Why did he join the Cabal in the first place? As it stands, we can't really assume anything about Freddy, other than the default assumptions we can make about any Cabal leader. I think what makes Freddy stand out so much is that they had just gotten this right in Novus. The Manticore is a significantly better villain, both because we actually get to hear him explain his reasoning, but also because his motivations tie directly to Design. Utilizing Design's powers was how he was going to achieve a new first world. But Freddy couldn't care less about Design. His plan is completely independent of him, and so it feels strangely disconnected from the arc storyline as a whole. Were it not for the thematic connections Freddy brings to the table, as I talked about earlier, he would feel completely superfluous to the proceedings. To be fair, sometimes that's enough. And also, I have a bone to pick with the particulars of this supposed summit. We see a majority of the Cabal members gathering together for what I can only presume is supposed to give the organization closure, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Why is a character like Vanitas here? It was made clear in Imperia Part 2 that Vanitas didn't really believe in the Cabal's mission. The organization was merely a means to an end, a way to escape the ether of the Imperian Storm. It doesn't seem to me like he really has any vested interest in the Cabal making up with the Arcanum. Also, isn't he supposed to be a prisoner in the Nimbus Citadel? Whatever. We could go through a similar analysis with many of the other characters here, but I think the point is clear. The summit doesn't feel nearly as well thought out as it could have been, and if the game wanted this storyline to be a critical element of the arc, it should have probably been a larger focus throughout. As it is, it feels a little too half-hearted to resonate properly. Unfortunately, the summit is the lesser of two problems here. Far more devastating is the way in which the expansion's ending fails to do right by Design, the arc's central character. The first problem is an empirical matter. Design is barely in the expansion at all. We see him periodically throughout Wallaroo, but it's never for more than a few sentences at a time. The first honest-to-goodness conversation with Design doesn't happen until 90% of the expansion is over, and he really only has two more scenes after that, after the Doom Moon is stopped. For an arc ostensibly about him, the main character is hardly included. This isn't necessarily a problem, quality over quantity and all that, but when the character only really has a total of three proper scenes, you certainly have your work cut out for you. The lack of design makes itself apparent in the expansion. Concepts like the dreaming are always hard to pull off. When your character has to come to some kind of internal revelation, it's hard not to make the solution feel somewhat pat if that realization comes after only a single conversation. It has to be slowly built up to over time. And indeed, we came to the Dreaming to help Design find clarity, but it's not clear what wisdom the Dreaming actually gave him that we couldn't have found out ourselves by simply talking to Design earlier in the expansion. Evidently, the Dreaming itself makes this point for me, with it ending up being little more than a single conversation. Thus, it's hard not to feel like the reason we don't end up speaking to Design earlier in the expansion is precisely because it would reveal the Dreaming to be a largely unnecessary feature of the story. Tenuous might be a better word here. As I've alluded to, Wallaroo itself seems to struggle to relate back to the main arc in any way other than thematic. I've mentioned how Freddy is largely disinterested in design, but other aspects feel disconnected as well. Much like dreams themselves, characters in Wallaroo seem to drift in and out of consciousness during our walkabout. We're introduced to Dundara in the early stages of the world, but he quickly leaves and never returns. Ned Colley is the central focus for the middle of the world, but his plotline is resolved in a side quest. 
Characters like Joan get introduced in the back half of the world, but are completely dropped by the time it comes to leave Wallaroo. This is not to suggest that every character should be relevant at all times and for every part of the world. Characters in Novus like Mubu and Tung Ok are introduced and resolved by the midpoint, the expansion recognizing that their story's been told and shouldn't be allowed to overstay their welcome. In general though, Wallaroo feels a little more clumsy in how it partitions out its story, standing in contrast to how deftly characters were handled in Novus. The Governors, Design, the Manticore, Copycat, all were weaved seamlessly in and out of the narrative, slowly building up each storyline over the course of the expansion. But the Dreaming is where Wallaroo ironically feels the most irrelevant. Design learns that he doesn't need to have an answer to who he's supposed to be. He learns that he needs to stand up for himself against those that would try to take advantage of him. But the story ultimately denies him the opportunity to express this learning. Design literally doesn't appear in the fight against the Doom Moon at all. He's instead usurped by the heroes of Lemuria, characters which have had no relevance to the expansion or the larger arc. In fact, the only point at which Design speaks in the final confrontation is two lines of exposition explaining where Copycat and Quake Charmer are hidden. The spiral powers are trying to nuke Design from orbit, and he seems not to care very much. Design is never forced to stand up for himself. There's a certain passivity to the whole affair, something even reflected in the gameplay. The final two bosses on the Doom Moon are characterized with cheats that involve not attacking. The whole climax of the arc seems allergic to conflict. Copycat was certain last expansion that Design spelled doom for the spiral, yet here she's willing to help us with ease. Certainly not an impossible development, but the notable part is that this conversation happens off screen. It's revealed the construction of the Doom Moon was an unsanctioned action on the part of the governors, and they are adequately punished by the leaders of the spiral powers. This seems a bit dubious. Would Marleybone really be against such a ploy? I'm not sure I buy it. The connection between all of these story beats, though, is that they detract from the story that actually matters, Design's. In some aspects, it feels like Wallaroo fails to grasp what Design's story was really about. Wallaroo reduced it to a matter of personal discovery, but that's not really the totality of his character. He knew what he wanted to be and why from the beginning, and certainly by the time he decided to sacrifice himself in Lemuria. No, the real issue at hand was not just a journey of reflective self-worth, but what to do when the people around you would exploit you for who and what you are. Design believes giving people agency is paramount, but he struggles to take away others' choices even when they would try to deny him his own. He's appalled when he learns what he did to the old one, Yet in Novus, he does the same to the Manticore. This critical event goes completely uncommented in Wallaroo. And when the game absolves the governments of the Spiral Powers, and allows the Wizard and the Heroes of Lemuria to do all the work for him, Wizard 101 robs Design of his own agency too. What if the Governor's actions had been sanctioned? What if they decided to send another Doom Moon his way? The Wizard can't defend him forever. Eventually, Design will have to learn to stand up for himself, to affirm his own wants and desires over those who don't care about him. What makes these issues frustrating is, though significant in nature, these problems wouldn't require too much retooling to mend. To suggest some, the easy choice here would be to include Design in the final battle, perhaps even something as small as allowing him to control the Doom Moon against the Armadas. Have the Spiral governments be complicit with the Doom Moon project, but allow Design to make strict terms to them, and the game doesn't have to promise a neat and tidy ending here. Furthermore, just ditch the Heroes of Lemuria. Instead, the infiltration of the moon should be headed by the Cabal Trio we've been following this arc, as well as some of the scholars like Malwer, Fiony, and Xander. Having the Cabal and the Arcanum work together to fight for Design foreshadows the summit at the end much better, as well as allowing for some time for the characters to actually reflect on what this little team-up actually means. Finally, change the summit to be something more symbolic. After several years of the wizard beating up Cabal commanders left and right, there realistically shouldn't be much left of them. Instead of a mass gathering of characters that really have no motivation to be there, the summit should just be the Arcanum scholars with the Cabal trio, who offer a gesture of peace to the Arcanum as a symbol to end the Cabal once and for all. The Cabal may not pose a threat anymore to the Spiral, but this gesture makes the statement that they don't want to be one either. Not anymore. 
These aren't mandates or anything. We could rework and expand story beats as much as we like, but I think you get the picture. A solid resolution to the story wouldn't require dozens of new quests or characters or epic battles. It's totally within the game's grasp. As with my mixed feelings of the third arc's ending, this certainly doesn't sour me on the story as a whole, but it's too bad that a character so brilliantly set up in Lemuria and Novus was let down right at the end. Wallaroo showed us that not all dreams are worth fighting for. I only wish Design had been allowed to fight for his own. With the fourth arc completed, I think it's important to reflect on how it went and where we might go next. After all, it's not every day a story arc gets concluded, and they don't exactly grow on trees. We can expect the fifth arc to finish in 2027 at the earliest, assuming the arc itself is only three expansions, so there's clearly plenty of time. Looking back, I would say arc 4 got a lot more right than it did wrong. I'm glad to see the game continuing to embrace its character work as the central focus, rather than nebulous prophecies and plot points as the main propulsion. I think if Arc 4 got into trouble anywhere, it's that it felt like it took a long time to get going. By the end of Caramel, it was hard to discern precisely what we had accomplished. Bartleby warned about the encroaching nothing, but this was really the same speech Sybil had given us at the end of Imperia. Caramel felt a bit like running in place. And while Lemuria did some great work with the sign, it wasn't until Novus came around that I felt like I actually had a grasp on where we were heading with the story overall. In hindsight, I think having Caramel and Lemuria before Novus was the correct choice, but each individual chapter didn't feel as satisfying or as compelling as it could have been in the moment. Yet another peril of telling a story over the course of multiple years. It's hard to be too upset about all this though, because the story Wizard 101 told here was fairly ambitious, and that's exactly the kind of thing a 15 year old game should be doing to stay relevant. But more so than growing pains within the game, it seems like the community also had some growing pains on the outside. I found myself somewhat exhausted by their reactions to the fourth arc story, which often seemed to range from apathy to outright discontent. One of the key story beats at the beginning of Lormuria was explaining who exactly the Nothing was, and why he looked exactly like the old one. The game makes emphatically clear they are not the same person, yet for the next two years, forum posts galore seem perplexed about the difference between the two, the plot point that confused a thousand Redditors. I remember watching one developer livestream where narrative lead Sam Johnson even apologized for the confusion. So, okay, this is, this is the big convoluted part of Arc 4 that if you're not paying attention uh, to the dialogue, you're not going to understand. This is the confusing part, and to the degree to which people have been confused by it, I apologize. And I mean, I'm just not really sure what to say. The game spells it out for us. Was something more needed? Occasionally, it feels like the reaction to any story that can't be immediately intuited after skipping all the dialogue is that it's too confusing. Because back in the good old days, you could understand that Malastair and Morganth were the bad guys without listening to a single word. Their names are highlighted in red, after all. More than that, there were accusations that the arc was merely filler, as if there was something more important for the game to be focusing on. What that something is, I really couldn't tell you. Moreover, of the very few videos that do pop up regarding Wizard 101's story on YouTube, they seem to be fairly negative on the arc on the whole, claiming it was too cerebral and unfocused. And I really don't like themes in games that humans can't inherently relate to. And that's also kind of the tale of the story for me, honestly. I really just don't care about it. It, it tries to be this really philosophical, deep thing, and it's just, I don't know. It's honestly really hard to relate to and follow as a casual player. In Lemuria, it was more about the old one and how not to play God. And in Novus, it's all about diplomatic relationships. I cannot, for the life of me, tell you what the ultimate meaning of Nothing's story is supposed to be without heavy speculation because it just isn't focused on enough. And while I too think there were pacing issues, I ultimately couldn't disagree more with their assessments. Wizard 101's fourth arc is easily the most human, relatable, and interesting out of all the arcs thus far. This is because arc 4 is a story about an individual learning to carve out his own identity, to make a mark in a world that, in some cases, is out to deny and abuse you. Such a story is far more compelling than, say, Malastare desperately trying to resurrect his dead wife, because the game spends time dedicated to actually telling it, rather than use the story merely as a framing device to deliver more quests. 
It's hard to get invested in Malister's plight when all we see of him is about four minutes over the course of five worlds. His story only really exists in a theoretical sense. Some have argued that the details about Design's existence are vague. This is true. How exactly our divine paradox form caused a breach in existence is murky at best, and the game never really expands on the mechanisms any further. But the game doesn't expand on these mechanisms because it correctly realizes that the specific mechanics simply don't matter at all. What matters isn't how Design got here, it's what happens now that he is here. That's where the story lies. This is the case more generally. Your universe's lore should only ever be there to serve the characters, and if it doesn't, well, there's really no reason to include it, other than to add some additional flavor. It's why Morganth fulfilling some ancient prophecy will always be a less compelling story than Raven and Spider's marriage counseling sessions. The important part isn't the prophecy, it's what the prophecy means to Morganth, an aspect woefully underexplored in the second arc. We spend much of the first arc chasing after the Croconomicon, but that's just a book. A great story would focus on Malastare's desperation to get it. And this focus on reoccurring characters is exactly what the third and fourth arcs get right. Characters like Bat and Malori and Design are what make the story worthwhile in the first place. They're the reason we come back every year to play through the next world. And even when those characters aren't on the screen, the events happening usually relate to them in some thematic way, reshaping seemingly disparate stories into a cohesive unit. Which is all to say that even though Arc 4 was certainly not perfect, I'm pleased with what I got. Design is my favorite character in the game, and his story was worth following through, even if it didn't end on the note I would have liked. All I can hope now is that the game continues to conceptualize its stories with the characters first and foremost, giving them interesting and novel challenges to face. But considering they've been doing that for a while now, I don't think I have too much to be worried about.